throwing indestructible lizards into vats of acid, hunting strange chicken men through forests in Ireland, arguing in Latin with a man wearing a haunted Roman centurion's helmet. When you join the SCP Foundation, you might be expecting high-octane drama all the time. Especially with the name Street Sweepers, you'd expect this mobile task force to be neck-deep in some real action-packed street racing. Maybe you wouldn't think that they'd be tasked with driving all day every day in four-hour shifts tailing a semi-truck all over Birmingham, Alabama. But as Agent Moore and his colleague pulled into the lay-by behind the truck, neither of them were ready for what they were about to witness. SCP-2590 was first discovered by the Foundation at a routine traffic stop. Investigating a totally different anomaly in the Birmingham area, Agents Peters and Smith had been posing as local police officers. The Foundation had been trying to track down an artifact that was supposedly being smuggled across the U.S. in the back of a nondescript station wagon. Peters and Smith had been allocated a pair of beat-up old police cruisers, which they'd parked across the dirt road fully blocking any traffic from coming through. It was several hours into their shift when the incident occurred, just at the point they were starting to lose focus. Taking a look through the suitcases and memorabilia from a family's trip to Disney World, Peters had taken way too long to hear the noise of the engine swelling behind him. He spun around to see the hulking shape of the semi-truck barreling straight towards him, Agent Smith, and a family of five. With only two seconds to react, he yelled out at the top of his lungs and dived out of the way, leaving the trunk of the car wide open with five screams emerging from inside. Smith, who had been sitting in one of the cruisers, only just managed to get out before the semi made contact. Eyes closed, Agent Peters waited for the inevitable sound of screaming rubber, the bang of metal on metal, and the shower of glass on asphalt, but it never came. When he opened his eyes, the station wagon was still parked up in front of them, the two police cruisers still blocking the road and all of the Disney merch still piled high in the trunk. The semi was driving off along the road, on the other side of their blockade, with not a scratch on it. Without a moment's hesitation, Agent Smith, who had kept his eyes open and witnessed the whole thing, leapt into action. He ordered his partner, still lying confused in the dirt, to administer Class A amnestics to the family and call in for backup. Agent Smith himself jammed his keys into the ignition, twisting them so hard he almost bent the metal, and took off after the vehicle. What Agent Smith and Peters had just witnessed was the very first Foundation exposure to SCP-2590, fondly nicknamed Trailer Trash. As Smith pulled up alongside the vehicle and studied it for the first time, he made a note of its initial appearance over the radio, an appearance which remains unchanged years later. The badges on the vehicle claim that it is an international Pro Star day cab semi trailer truck, complete with an unmarked trailer. As the agent flicked on his lights and indicated that the vehicle should pull over, he noted that it didn't have any license plates on it, either front or rear. He leaned forward in his seat, trying to peer into the cab to make out the driver, but in the Alabama sun, the man just looked like a shadowy figure. They drove side by side along the road for almost a mile. The truck made no signs of pulling over despite Agent Smith's continued insistence and repeated flashes of the cop lights, but it also didn't attempt to pull away either. It just continued to drive a few miles per hour below the speed limit. The driver didn't seem to look across at him once. Having discussed it with Foundation staff, they decided it was best not to draw attention to the situation. They had no idea whether this SCP was hostile or posed any threat to civilian life, but having blue and red lights flashing at it appeared to be doing little to change the situation. Instead, he switched off the sirens and pulled in behind the truck, tailing it around Birmingham as the Foundation readied further agents to respond to the situation. For almost an hour, nothing of note happened. Agent Smith drove behind the trailer, watching it like a hawk. He observed that it obeyed every traffic law to a T. It never broke the speed limit, never cut anyone off, and left room for other vehicles to merge. If it hadn't seen it drive straight through a roadblock as if it wasn't there, he would have never suspected a thing. But then the truck turned its turn signal on. They had just come off the highway and merged onto a quiet side street, just as the sun was starting to hang low in the sky. The truck crept across the side of the road, squeezing its brakes gently, and stopped. Agent Smith matched the action the whole way, pulling up about 20 feet behind the trailer, 
In constant radio communication, he kicked open his door and stepped out into the evening air. Foundation personnel advised that he keep his hand on his gun at all times and approach with caution. He didn't really need them to tell him that. Smith called for the driver to step out of the cab. No response. The truck just sat there with its hazards on, engine off. After a moment, there was a clunk, and the trailer door started to slowly open, all by itself. Agent Smith called in backup, but they were still several minutes out. Instead, he ran back to the car, gun raised, and waited to see what was inside as the door slowly opened to reveal nothing. No, not quite nothing. There was something small on the floor of the trailer, right in the center as if it hadn't been moved around at all by the vehicle's motion. It was red, a kind of elongated cuboid. He reported it all to the Foundation over his radio, then paused when he recognized what it was. A Kit Kat candy bar, or to be more specific, a Kit Kat Chunky. What happened after this point was hazy. Agent Smith was found on the roadside just 20 minutes later, confused about what had happened. The truck was nowhere in sight. However, a security camera from a convenience store just up the street happened to capture the interaction. In the footage, you see Agent Smith approaching the trailer with his gun raised, looking at the Kit Kat. He tries to enter the trailer, but is unable to, so he approaches the driver's side door. While talking to the shadowy figure in the cab, he drops his gun and stands motionless, a confused and sleepy expression on his face, until the trailer door closes and the SCP drives away. Contact was re-established with SCP-2590 soon after, and has been maintained almost uninterrupted ever since. The findings made on that initial encounter seem to hold true across further examination. Personnel have reached out to Navistar International, the company that supposedly manufactures this model of semi-truck, but there appears to be no records of its creation or shipment to the US. In fact, no documentation at all can be attributed to the truck or any components on it. The driver in the front cab is a humanoid figure who is perpetually shrouded in shadow, designated SCP-2590-1. Attempts to reveal the driver's figures have proved ineffective, as even powerful spotlights do not shed enough light into the cab to render the driver visible. Quite what this driver's role is in the operation of SCP-2590 is unknown. SCP-2590-1 appears to have some proximity-based amnestic qualities, as anyone approaching it on foot has reported memory loss and confusion soon after, just like Agent Smith. As also discovered by the two agents and their roadblock, containment of this SCP is simply not possible. While the majority of the time the SCP is corporeal, it possesses the ability to pass through solid objects at will. All attempted roadblocks have resulted in the same thing happening. The SCP will just phase right through on them, as if nothing was there. Since it cannot be contained in the usual way, a different operation has been set up to monitor the truck's activities, which, so far, have proven to be apparently harmless to the civilian population. Mobile Task Force Gamma-133, also known as the Street Sweepers, has been established to follow this SCP around Birmingham at all times. They operate in four-hour shifts, with two agents in unmarked vehicles sticking close behind the trailer at all times. The Foundation was able to fit a tracking device onto it as well, providing researchers with continuous location data for where they can find the vehicle. At seemingly random times, supposedly determined by the SCP itself, it pulls over somewhere quiet and opens the door to its trailer. The door will remain open for 60 seconds and then close again. Any attempts to enter the trailer have been blocked by some kind of invisible barrier, seemingly impenetrable to most approaches. More violent and destructive methods of entry cannot be authorized for testing, due to the heavy civilian population in the surrounding area. Every time the doors open, there is something different in the trailer. Researchers are trying to ascertain some kind of pattern or messaging behind most of the objects, but many seem to be random. The current list of things that have appeared in the back of SCP-2590 include an iPhone 3G, a red apple, and a lit light bulb without any visible form of power supply. Most notable about the objects in the trailer is that often they appear to be human beings, as happened on the night that Agent Moore was on duty in the Street Sweepers. The agents pulled in behind the truck as per usual when it slowed to a stop beside the highway. Agent Moore got out of the vehicle second, unenthused about the monotony of the task he had been assigned. Expecting to see a cardboard box or a chapstick when the trailer door opened, 
he was left shocked when he came face to face with himself. Few people can say they have seen themselves in real life. Most of them have been administered with various anesthetics to make them forget, but Agent Moore went on to report how bizarre of an experience it was. He claimed that it was utterly unlike looking in a mirror where your reflection is flipped and follows your every move. Seeing yourself standing in three dimensions, moving independently and evidently in a great deal of distress is an experience that few would envy. Any time a human being materializes in the trailer, they appear to be in a great deal of distress as they attempt to escape through the invisible barrier. Agent Moore and his partner Agent Hall could do nothing but stand and watch in confusion as the copy of him attempted to free himself before. After the usual 60 seconds, the trailer door closed and the vehicle pulled away again. Several instances have occurred of duplicate humans appearing in the trailer, but each time the original person seems to have had no knowledge of this taking place and nothing out of the ordinary happens to them. However, there appears to be some small pattern demonstrating the SCP as an awareness of the Foundation, as it has also duplicated Agent Inglis's sister who has no connection to this SCP at all. Incident 16 was the most distressing of all, as a large slab of metal appeared in the back of the trailer, with the SCP Foundation logo painted across it. Agent Inglis and Schultz were on duty at this time, and observed copious amounts of blood flowing out of the metal slab. Before long, the blood filled the back of the trailer, pushing up against the invisible barrier. All of a sudden, 52 seconds into the encounter, the barrier vanished, and a cascade of blood with the slab inside were launched out at the two agents at a speed of over 190 kilometers an hour, killing them both instantly. Since this incident, SCP-2590 has been treated with greater caution. The most mysterious thing to have come from researching this truck came on December 4, 2011, when, for the first time, the truck's tracking beacon stopped working. It had been seen pulling into an abandoned warehouse, and so a team of street sweepers was immediately dispatched to investigate. When they arrived, they found the vehicle moving through the warehouse at a slow crawl. Choosing to pursue on foot and leave a pair of agents at the entrance, they followed the SCP through the facility until it came to what agents described as a service tunnel or sewer of some sort. Putting headlamps on, they followed the truck down into the tunnel, maintaining radio contact throughout. As they reported the direction they were traveling and the distance, it quickly became apparent to Foundation personnel that this was no ordinary tunnel. The warehouse was positioned overlooking a cliff, and so the geography was not physically possible. As the street sweepers descended further into the tunnel, they noted there was increased levels of carbon monoxide. Radio contacts started to dip in and out, losing signal as they went further downhill. Just at the edge of their signal with the Foundation, the truck stopped and opened its trailer door. Inside was just a single piece of parchment with the words, I'm just delivering a message written on it. After the usual 60 seconds, the trailer door closed and the truck continued. After they had passed the kilometer mark, the radio signal worsened quickly and after a couple of scrambled messages, the team down there were not heard from again. The channel stayed open for another six hours before the Foundation made the decision to announce the agents missing in action. In March 2015, over three years later, a radio signal came into contact with the Foundation again from Birmingham, Alabama. It was from the headset of the squad leader who had gone into the tunnel. Initially confused as to who had gained access to the comms channel, the Foundation demanded that the agent state his full name and rank. The agent, himself confused, obliged, questioning why they were so suspicious. He and his team claimed to have only lost contact for about 15 minutes. They had followed the FCP a little further until carbon monoxide levels had risen too high to continue, at which point they had watched the truck disappearing into the distance as they walked back to the surface. All agents have undergone extensive psychological rehabilitation to settle them back into society, as well as classes to fill them in on things like the London Olympics, the Ice Bucket Challenge, and Gangnam Style. As for SCP-2590, it is back out on the roads, roaming around Birmingham, Alabama continuously, never stopping for fuel, always obeying the rules of the road, occasionally opening its trailer doors to reveal new and bizarre findings. Now check out Living Ice Cream Van, SCP-1386, and SCP-342, A Ticket to Ride for more.